Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for our Alumni Day in House Plants 101. Uh, I understand these are challenging times for many of us and for so many different reasons, but I hope today this fun and educational webinar brings you some joy. Uh, we're here to help build our RAM community and we hope this can be a resource for you in one of those ways. I wanna thank everyone who's joining us today. We have over 60 people who are gonna be joining in. Um, and we would love if you could put in the chat, if you'll click all attendees and, and panelists, and then let us know where you're tuning in from. If you wanna include your grad year, we also always love to know when you graduated from CSU, if you are an alumnus. Uh, but please go ahead and put in the chat now where you're tuning in from. We always love to know uh, where you're watching. Many of our attendees are also CSU Alumni Association members. So if you are a CSU Alumni Association member joining us today, thank you so much for your membership. It really does help support so much of what we do at the Alumni Association. As a reminder, this is a webinar, so you're automatically muted with your camera off. So please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature to ask any questions throughout. Um, Cherie, our wonderful presenter today, will take some different times throughout the presentation to answer questions on the topic she just covered. So please keep those questions coming as they, as they come up for you. We love to hear them and she's a great resource to answer all things houseplants for you today. Um, in just a moment, it looks like she may have already done that. My colleague Dakota is helping me with the chat today, so she'll be putting a lot of different resources um, in the chat box, so please feel free to check those out. We've got links to the Pueblo CSU Extension page, some of Cherie's articles, as well as the CSU Alumni Association calendar. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce you to today's guest speaker, Cherie Schaefer, who is a Pueblo native, and she got her master's degree in botany at CSU Pueblo in 2015, and shortly after began working at CSU Extension in Pueblo County as the horticulture agent. She loves to garden and spend time outside with her three dogs, husband, and son. So Sheree, it's awesome to have you here again with us today. I will let you take it away on one of my favorite topics, houseplants. Yeah, awesome. I see that you have quite a few nice looking houseplants with you there. So that's awesome. You're, you look like you do better than me, to be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So like Rachel said, we're going to be talking houseplant 101 today. Um, I do pretty good with the outside plants, but I've struggled a little bit houseplants it's a uh, you got to kind of figure them out and we're going to hopefully give you some tips today to be able to figure out your house plans that you have at your house so just kind of an outline of what we're going to be talking about today we, i kind of want to talk a little bit about how much in popularity house plants have been gaining it just in especially this year um a little bit of history on house plants because they've been around a really long time the benefits, there's a ton of benefits to have plants in your home or office, so we'll go over that. And then, of course, care. We'll spend a lot of time talking about care, um, kind of just in general, things that you should do, things that you shouldn't do. We'll go over a few propagation methods. It's always good to know what to do in case you're at somebody's house and they have a really cool plant and you want to kind of steal a little bit of it and bring it home. And then we'll go over some specific houseplants that you can try and uh, some specific care for them. And you can see some pictures of them and maybe get inspired to bring a new houseplant into your life. So houseplants are really all the rage right now. You can Google, I was having so much fun with pictures for this presentation because if you Google like houseplants Instagram, there's so many like cool trendy pictures like this one and they're just really in right now. Um, particularly since the pandemic, their popularity has really bloomed. <laughs> um, so 12% of plant buyers, house plant buyers, specifically in March, were actually first timers. So, you know, people were staying home a lot, um, kind of wanted a little bit of a hobby to get their minds off of what's going on in the world. And I think a lot of people just turned to house plants for that. Google searches about, half, about house plants have skyrocketed this year. And actually the most searched house plant that has been searched on Google has been aloe vera by far. So that's kind of interesting. That's one that everybody wants to learn about. Um, so not only has this year brought a lot of popularity for house plants, but just in the recent, you know, the last few years, actually in the last three years, house plant sales in the U.S. have increased 50% to $1.7 billion a year. So they're really raking in the dough with these house plants as well. 
Um, millennials seem to be driving the revival. People are kind of waiting longer to have kids, um, to kind of settle down and having a houseplant is a way to be able to care for something and have your, you know, loving side, but not have to have such a commitment as like a kid or a pet, you know, you can go on vacation and your houseplant will still be there when you get back. So they find that millennials are really, really driving that trendiness of the houseplant. A little bit of history on houseplants. Um, indoor gardening can actually be traced all the way back to the early Greeks and Romans, bringing plants inside to kind of brighten up indoor spaces. The Japanese for centuries have been dwarfing trees to grow indoors as bonsai trees. In 1652 was the first time that um, the theory of a greenhouse was written about and then around that same time that the first small one was actually constructed. So that's really long time ago that we we're starting to try to make these perfect indoor environments for different plants. And then in the mid 1800s, mid to late 1800s during kind of the Victorian era, they became very, very popular as a way to kind of brighten up long, dreary English winters. You can see in this picture, this is kind of a classic Victorian scene. You would never see a scene without a, a few plants in it. So they became all the rage, um, mostly like wealthier people had them, and then they've just kind of taken off from there. Even in modern times, as we spend more time at our desk and in our homes and our offices, we want to kind of bring the outside in. So they have had a long history, still going strong today. Like I said, a lot of benefits about have, to have a houseplant. You bring the outdoors in, and they're actually heavily used in interior design. You'll notice if you look at any interior design photos on the internet, you'll always usually see like a ficus tree in the corner or some kind of plant in the picture. Um, NASA has actually found that plants do clean the air. They remove pollutants and harmful compounds and they make the air in your home of a higher quality, which is really great, especially right now with all the fires. Um, it's best to do whatever we can to increase our air quality in our homes. They also actually add humidity to the air. I saw quite a few of you are from Colorado. You know, our air could get pretty dry sometimes. So adding humidity to the air is definitely a good thing around here. Um, making your air a little more humid when you live in a dry area reduces the likelihood of dry skin and other skin issues, common colds, and sore throats. So that's definitely a good thing to do. There's also been a ton of studies that show that having plants around you inside increases your happiness and decreases the likelihood that you would experience symptoms of depression. That's a great thing. Um, and then Texas A&M actually did a study that having plants where you work or where you study greatly increases the quality of work that you put out. So all these great benefits just from having plants around us inside if that's not enough to want to bring a house plant in, I don't know what is. So let's kind of get down to talking about cultural care a little bit here. I guess what we first need to start out with is a container. If you're going to plant a new house plant or bring a new house plant in, you are going to need to pick a container. So the biggest thing to consider is the material. Things that are more porous and lightweight, like a wood or a clay, they have those kind of pores where air can move through them. So they do tend to need more water, more watering, but they have really good oxygen movement. And I think that's something people forget is that plants don't only need water, the roots also need oxygen. So that's actually a good thing that they have better oxygen movement. Maybe depending on um, how much effort you like to put into your plants, needing more water might be good or bad, <laughs> but those are just kind of some pros and potential cons. Pla things like plastic and glazed ceramic hold water better. You'll have to water less often, but the air movement isn't quite as good. So again, pros and cons, it really comes down to personal preference. You know, are you, would you rather have them go a little longer without water? Maybe plastic or ceramic is good for you. What kind of um, aesthetics do you like? Which ones look nice to you? It's really personal preference. Any of these materials are fine, but one thing I would always, always look for or add if you need to is a drainage hole. You really don't want to have a container that doesn't have drainage. Um, if you, they, a lot of the really nice, um, like ornamental pots 
don't have holes in the bottom. So you can always pot your plant in like an ugly plastic pot that has good drainage holes and then stick that inside your um, decorative pot. That way you get the function of the drainage. You know, you could take it out when you water it, but it still looks really nice inside of that decorative pot. That's something that I, I do with my plants all the time. Now light. This might be one of the biggest things to consider with houseplants. You'll see when you buy a houseplant or when you start to research that houseplant, it'll say, you know, low light, medium, high light, and then there also might be direct and indirect light. So let's talk a little bit about how to achieve those different conditions. Normally, if for low light, you're going to be looking for a north-facing window, a north-facing area in your home. Medium light from an east-facing window, and then usually your south and west-facing windows will give you that high light. Now, this kind of depends on the time of year, the distance from the window, you know, even if, it, if you have a south or west-facing window but the plant is very far from it, that might not be really considered high light, so you have to take some of that stuff into consideration. Um, curtains also might kind of um, dim down the intensity of light. So those are the levels of light. And then you might see direct and indirect. So direct light is when the sun's rays are actually coming in the window and those rays are hitting your plant. That's direct light. Indirect light is when the plant is away from the window and the sun's rays aren't necessarily touching it, but it still is in light. So indirect light can still be bright, but it's just not the sun's rays directly hitting the plant. It's getting kind of like an ambient light from the environment. Temperature. Um, most houseplants are tropical, so they like it to be a little bit warmer. So just in general, um, typically houseplants in general are going to like their daytime temperatures to be between 70 and 80 degrees, and their nighttime temperatures to be between 65 and 70 degrees. These are pretty common temperature ranges for a, an average home to be. So that's why these plants typically do well inside of a home. You know, if you might like it really hot or really cold, you might be outside of these ranges, but this is what you wanna shoot for if you wanna make the perfect environment in your home for plants. Ideally, so humidity is another big one. Like I said, most house plants that we bring into the home are tropical, so most of them are going to like high humidity. Again, I already touched on this, but high humidity is not something we typically experience in Colorado. So this could be one of our biggest challenges as far as keeping our houseplants happy. So ideally, we want our humidity levels in the home to be 40 to 60%. Again, not really that common to be that high in Colorado. But the drier the air, the more water the plant will lose. So you might just have to water a little bit more than somebody in a more humid area would but it's totally possible to keep these plants alive here. If you do think that you're suffering from some humidity issues with your plants, humidifiers work really well. You know, you bust it out when you're sick. Um, you could also bust it out when your plants are looking like they just need a little pick-me-up. Those work really, really well. Um, a couple other things that you might find on the internet that actually studies have found don't work really well is, for one, misting the leaves. Um, you would need to do that, like, a lot like pretty much all day for that to really effectively increase the humidity so functionally that's not a super practical way to increase the humidity around your plants and then you also might have heard of pebble trays which the picture is of a little pebble tray here it's just basically um, a dish or a tray that's filled with pebbles and then you put water in and you know the idea is that the water kind of will evaporate and increase the humidity around the plant it's been found that they don't actually increase the humidity levels that much around the plant. Um, maybe a tiny bit, but really not much at all. But it doesn't hurt and it actually kind of looks um, a little bit nice. So you can definitely try a pebble tray. You probably won't get a big rise in humidity from it, but again, definitely won't hurt. Watering. This is probably one of the biggest questions I get is how often do I water X plant? And that's a question I can never answer because it depends on so much. <clears throat> Obviously, it depends on the plant species. Some houseplants are going to need a lot more water. Some, like a cacti or something like that, are going to need, you know, hardly any water. 
So that really makes a difference. The container, like we talked about, the material of the container makes a huge difference. The planting media, so the potting soil or whatever you have it potted in, makes a huge difference. Some hold water a lot better than others. The environment in your home, you know, the humidity levels, how much light it's getting, the temperature, all of those play into how often you need to water your plants. So it's really hard for anybody to tell you how often, but the best advice I can give you is don't water on a schedule. That's never good to say like, you know, every second Saturday I water all my plants. It's much, much better to just check in with your individual plants and water when they need it. Almost all house plants, you know, with the exception of those that like to be very moist and those that like to be very dry, the vast majority are going to want to dry out slightly between waterings and, um, you know, never get totally dry. So kind of the, the best general rule I could tell you is to stick your finger down into the soil or the planting medium to about your first knuckle. When the soil feels dry down to your first knuckle, that's when you want to um, give it some water. There are some plants that will tell you right away too, like my peace lilies will start to droop as soon as they're dry down to that level. And I can notice, I'm like, oh, that one looks a little bit sad today, it needs some water. So some plants will definitely help you out and let you know like, hey, I need some water over here. Um, others, not so much, so you have to check. Overwatering and underwatering are equally bad. So that's why it's really good to just check in with those plants. Get your fingers in there, touch them. Some plants can be a little bit like finicky with water and you just kind of have to work with it, figure it out, figure out how often you're about doing it in your specific house. Um, and you know, you can get used to it once you get into a routine with a certain plant. Whenever you do water any plant, you do want to water thoroughly. Watering thoroughly allows the water to sink down so that the roots can grow a little bit deeper into the pot. <clears throat> so you always want to water until the water actually drains out of the drainage holes in the pot. If your plant is sitting in a saucer, like the plant in this photo, um, once it drains out, you do want to discard that water. Most plants are not going to want to sit in standing water. That is just asking for root rot. So discard anything that drains out. <clears throat> um, higher light levels obviously are going to dry plants out more, higher temperatures are going to dry plants out more, lower humidities are going to dry plants out more. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you have plants with long leaves, like a spider plant or a snake plant, they are sensitive to chlorine and fluorine, which is naturally occurring in, in like municipal tap water. So what you should do is, you know, always have your water cans full. Once you water, fill it, fill it up again and let it sit out. As the water sits out, the fluorine and the chlorine will kind of dissipate from the water a little bit. Also that helps with temperature because some plants aren't going to want to be watered with very cold water. So if you let it sit out, you get rid of some of those harmful compounds, it warms up to room temperature and that's a better water to water with. Those long leaved plants will sometimes start to brown on the tips. If you have like a spider plant or something and you see it browning on the tips and you have no idea why, that could be it. Try letting your water sit out before you water. Fertilizer. Indoor plants really do need fertilizer. Um, you know, they're kind of stuck in that same soil, some for, you know, decades. So they really need to kind of be revived with a little bit more nutrients. Some plants need a relatively a lot of fertilizer, like a ficus. Some need almost none, like a cacti. So it um, definitely pays to do a little bit of research into your specific plant. Um, typically though, just generally speaking, most plants are only really going to need to be fertilized during the growing season. So, you know, just in the spring and summer, you really don't need to fertilize houseplants during fall and winter. And when it's, there are signs that it's needed. So maybe the color is looking a little dull or you see it starting to kind of yellow or fade, or you notice that it really hasn't um, grown in a while. Those are signs that it's time to fertilize. So there's some different methods. You can kind of do um, a very low rate, like a quarter rate um, of, a, of a fertilizer every time that you water. 
or you could do, you know, the suggested rate on the package, on the label, and just do it, you know, maybe a couple times a year. You also can mix in a slow release fertilizer. So that would look like the photo to the right here. They're kind of usually like granular and you can just kind of knead them into the top of the soil or just top dress, just throw them on top and water them in. And those will feed your plant for, uh, you know, a longer time, depending on the product, check the label, how long those will feed the plant for. But those are also a good option. Um, whatever product you choose, find a product that, you know, is labeled for houseplants, follow the instructions on the label, and you should be good to go. Um, so before we move into talking a little bit about pests, I'm going to just like check the chat really quick and see if there's questions about care um, that have come in. Yeah, it looks like there's two in the Q&A and then one that just popped into the chat. So the first one was, what about watering with those bulbs that you fill up with water and then leave in your plant? Yeah, those are great if maybe you're going to just be gone for like a day or something um, or a weekend. Those can kind of um, keep your plant watered while you're gone. You know, if it's just a couple days, you could also water before, but the bulbs won't give you um, like a whole week's worth of freedom. You know, if you think your plant might need watered within that week, the bulb will drain and then um, won't be that longer lasting. But they look really cool in the plant, I think, and they definitely are fine to use. I like how they look too. Uh, this question is, day and night temperatures in my house in winter don't usually get above 70, usually between 65 and 70. It gets up to 75, 80 during the summer. Are there any particular plants that would do better with these temperatures? Yeah, there are plants that like um, warmer temperatures and plants that like it a little cooler. Generally speaking, though, any of these plants that you bring into your home when you're, you know, if it's in a range that you're, that you're comfortable as a human, the plant can adapt to it. Absolutely. Um, you know, some things like cacti and aloe don't really like it to be on the colder end, but they can absolutely adapt. So don't worry, you're not really that limited as far as what you can bring in, that they, they'll get used to it. Awesome. Um, Jen is wondering, are certain container materials better for different types of plants? Yeah, absolutely. Plants that are more low water will do better in like a clay or something that has more air movement and um, keeps it just like not so soggy. And plants that like it to be a little bit more on the moist side will do better in like a plastic or ceramic. And I'll go over some plants, um, you know, you can absolutely, there's so much online where you can just look up and see if your plant kind of likes it more dry or more wet, but generally speaking, they all want to be like dried out to like that first knuckle, like I said. Awesome. Melissa is wondering if we need to clean the leaves periodically. Yes, I think I have this um, a little bit further down in the presentation, but yeah, plants with large leaves, um, like, you know, peace lilies, phyllodendrons, they will get dusty, just like anything else in your house. So you do want to wipe them off with a damp rag. You don't want to use a leaf shine product. They sell products that are, like, labeled to shine your houseplant leaves, but they're oil-based, and they tend to clog the pores in the leaves, and um, they're, they're found to do more harm than good. So you want to stay away from those. Awesome. And last question on this section is, Wendy has some old fertilizer, both liquid and powder, and she's wondering if she could still use it or if it expires after a certain amount of time. You know, so long as it still it resembles what it looked like when you first bought it, you know, as long as the powder hasn't like hardened into a rock or, and the liquid is still, you know, not all chunky looking or anything like that, you should be just fine to use it. And you know, they can last a really long time. So it should be just fine. Awesome. Looks like that's all the questions for this section, Sheree. Perfect. So let's move on to talking a little bit about pests. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over a few of the really common ones that you might see on houseplants um, and just some general stuff about, about pests initially. So before you buy a houseplant, look it over really well in the store. If you see any signs of, you know, webs or 
or you know holes or discoloration or actual flecking or insects um, you don't want to buy that one and then even if you do check it out you don't see anything when you bring your plant home put it in i know this word is like taking on a holy meaning but quarantine it for a couple weeks and monitor it keep it away from your other plants just in case it does have something going on it doesn't spread to all of the house plants in the house so to quarantine it for a couple weeks monitor it if it looks good after that little quarantine period go ahead and let it be around the other plants I will caution you to be really aware of home, like homemade remedies. Again, there's so much stuff on the internet for pest control. I would definitely stick to something from like an extension office or a university because some of these homemade remedies can be harmful to the plants. Um, you know, if they're using like dish soap or vinegar and you don't get the amounts right or the specific product you're using is very strong, you could end up hurting your plants. So I would definitely stick to like a really scholarly source when you're looking up um, remedies to get rid of pests on houseplants. And I'm not going to really talk about too much diseases of like leaf diseases because they're really hard to ID, they're really hard to control, it's hard to say if you know if you have like brown spots or yellowing or some kind of discoloration on the, your, um, on the leaves of your plant. The best advice really just in general for that is to remove the infected leaves and try to um, maybe decrease humidity. Sometimes that causes like fungal issues, um, but just trying to prune them out and, um, you know, make sure that you're doing everything right as far as watering, maybe move it to a new spot, see if that helps. <coughs> but for houseplants, those foliar like leaf diseases are, are really hard to say what exactly is going on. So I'll just kind of say that general statement about those. So let's talk pests. Scale and mealybugs is one that you definitely might see. Um, very, very common on a lot of different houseplants. So there's a whole list here. Um, some of the common ones, you know, most ferns, palms, ficus, pothos, phylodendron, um, chaflera, jade, African violets, those and, you know, many more <laughs> um, are, are prone to scale and mealybugs. So you'll see these like white, kind of fluffy looking, they actually are an insect um, on the, the kind of near the joints of your plants normally, and they kind of look fluffy. Um, and that's when you know you'll have scale and mealybugs. So um, if it's just on a branch or two, just prune them off and get rid of them right away. You can use insecticidal soaps that you can purchase at a garden center. You can also try out a 10% rubbing alcohol mixture. You'll want to test that on a small area first before you spray it all over your entire plant. Um, just because, you know, the specific plant could react bad to that rubbing alcohol mixture. Um, so just test it out first. If you have a small, just a small outbreak, you can just put some straight up rubbing alcohol on a Q-tip and just touch the mealybugs themselves and that can help. You can also buy something systemic. So that would be something that you water into the soil and then the plant takes it up and then that insecticide is actually located in the plant. The good thing about using that in that house plant is, you know, there's not really a lot of concerns about harming pollinators. So something like that is more safe to use indoors. Um, and the ingredient that you'd wanna look for is the matocloprid, which is pretty common. Aphids definitely will develop on, on a lot of different houseplants. Um, some people have ornamental peppers in the house. They're susceptible. Hibiscus, your mums if you bring them in for the winter. A lot of um, garden herbs that you may have kept outside during the summer and then you bring them in um, have the chance to have aphids, uh, an aphid outbreak. So the best thing to do is just to wash them off with water inside or outside. That's always where you should start with an aphid outbreak is just a strong jet of water, wash them off. They're pretty weak insects in general. So usually that will do the trick. Um, if it's an outbreak that you just can't control with just water, insecticidal soaps, um, insecticide, insecticides with pyrethroid ingredients may be effective, but really washing them off, like just putting them in the bathtub and spraying them off will probably handle the aphid problem for you. Spider mites, this happens in a lot when um, we have a plant that is kept a little bit on the dry side. So our ivies, figs, Norfolk Island pines, chaffleras, you might see spider mites happening on those. Again, they're tiny, they're kind of weak. You can just wash them off with water in a lot of situations. Since they do like those drier conditions, 
Um, you can try increasing how much you water and increasing the humidity. Horticultural oils or insecticides with the ingredient bifenthrin. Um, and then insecticidal soaps are marginally effective. They, they aren't quite as good as the oils, but they can do, they can do a little bit for you. And I can definitely send these slides um, out. I know there's a lot of like ingredients and big words here. So I can send these out so you don't have to worry about writing these all down and spelling them out and stuff like that. Fungus gnats. I think these are probably the most common houseplant pests because since they develop in the soil, really any houseplant could be a host. They don't really pick and choose and they don't harm the plants at all. But it is such a nuisance to have fungus gnats flying around your home. So it's definitely something people want to control. So um, first thing you should try is to just let your soil dry out a little bit more between waterings. That would kill the eggs that are in the soil. These yellow sticky traps that you see in the picture, they, you know, it doesn't really look super appealing to have like a bunch of dead gnats on a card in your home, but they really do work well to trap the adults. So, you know, even if maybe you just need to use that along with letting it dry out for a short amount of time to get ahead of it, that is definitely something that you might want to try. Um, there is a biological control, a strain of bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, variety Israeliensis. <laughs> it's also known as the H14 strain. It's a pretty common strain. Um, highly effective as a soil drench. So something you just pour into the soil, it will control the larva and, and will help your problem. They also make a neem based soil drench that will kill the larva. I think that one's a little bit harder to find. You might have to order that one online, but all of those are good options to help with your fungus gnat issues. Okay, so that's what I have for pests. Um, what Do we have any questions about pests specifically? We had one question in Q&A with the fungus gnat problem. So I typed in the answer since you were on that slide. Oh, cool. um, she was saying that the neem oil and cinnamon hasn't worked for her, but she likes to keep it natural because she has kids in the house. Yeah. Um, totally. So I commented maybe trying those yellow sticky traps. That's something I've found works for mine, but I didn't know if you had any other thoughts on the natural side of things for her. Um, you know, I would always start, of course, with just letting it dry out a little bit more, not to the point that you're going to sacrifice the health of the plant, but yeah, Rachel is absolutely right. Those sticky traps really do work wonders. They're very sticky when you try to put them on. They get stuck yeah. in your hands a little bit, so they do work really well. Totally. Um, if anyone else has any questions about pests, please feel free to pop them in the chat real quick before we move on. I know this, this part isn't always as fun to talk about with houseplants, but is so necessary to know about. So thanks for covering it, Cherie. Sure thing. Looks like um, we don't okay. have any more at this time. Perfect. Hey, if anything comes up, feel free to type them in and I'll get to them. But let's talk a little bit about propagation. So I have friends who always are coming over like, oh, hey, your philodendron's looking a little long. Maybe I could get a cutting. And, you know, I like to see plants at other people's houses and try to snag them as well. So um, it's good if you want to increase your population of houseplants for cheap. And it's also just really satisfying to propagate your own little piece of houseplant and actually have it make it and turn into another plant. So I wanted to go over some methods. Um, depending on the type of plant, there are like four different methods that we're going to talk about. So this is, I think, one of the most common stem cuttings. This is uh, the method you want to use for plants that grow leaves along a stem. So here's a diagram of a stem, um, and you are going to want to make your cut right below a, a node. So a node is where the leaf attaches to the stem, and you want to make your cut right below a node, and then you want to remove the lower leaves. So, you know, leave one or two leaves at the top. And then you can place that cut end in water or in soil. If you place it in soil, you can try to dip it in like a rooting hormone or a rooting powder first. Not really always necessary, but it definitely helps the rooting process along. Um, and then you'll grow a root from that node, usually is where it'll grow from. Um, a lot of plants root just fine in water. A lot of the common ones that you would try. You may need, if you haven't had luck with this method, you may just have too low humidity. So what you should try is to make the cut, put it in your soil or water, and then cover the whole thing, container and all, with a big like gallon plastic bag and mist the plant every once in a while so that you create kind of a little greenhouse. 
and then just very gradually have it be exposed more and more to the air until you can actually remove the bag and it's doing well. So some plants that you might want to try this with are pothos, blushing philodendron, monstera, or Swiss ivy. Now leaf cuttings um, are good for plants that are kind of um, don't have a lot of stem and they're like all leaves. So you want to cut a medium sized healthy leaf. You do want to include a couple inches of petiole, which is the stem that the leaf is attached to. There's a diagram for you um, to remind you what a petiole is. And then you want to plant it kind of shallow, only about a half inch down into potting soil. And then treat it as a stem cuttings. If you need to increase the humidity with a plastic bag, you can do that for the leaf cutting as well. So this is something that you can try with African violets, begonias, Christmas cactus, and jade. Now the plants like the African violet and the begonia, they can just be cut and then planted right away. The more succulent plants like the Christmas cactus and the jade would do better if you let them sit out a little bit after the cutting and callus over on that cut end. Um, that decreases the chance that they'll get um, rot once you try to plant them. So with the succulents, let them sit out. Other kinds of plants, they could just go straight into the soil. Division. Um, so some plants will want to be divided just like a perennial would out in your garden when it starts to get overcrowded and you know you divide um, any of your perennial flowers out in your garden. So it's literally what it sounds like here. You're just going to remove your plant from the pot and cut through that root ball to make separate plants. Depending on how crowded it is or how big it is, you know, um, you can make anywhere from two plants to who knows up to five or six, I guess. Um, but just as many as you think you can get out of that and then you'll repot it into a smaller pot. You'll have a smaller plant, but you'll have brand new plants. I split my peace lilies all the time because I had a bunch of old ones and now I've just been splitting them every summer and now I have like 12 peace lilies in my house. So I need to give them away as gifts or something. But um, these are good for plants that grow from a central crown like the peace lily, the Boston fern, or the snake plant can be divided. And then rooting plantlets. So obviously we're talking spider plant here. Um, there are also some orchids that can be propagated with this method, but spider plant is the, the big one here. So as you know, if you have a spider plant, sometimes they will grow new baby plantlets on their flower stalks or with other plants that might be along their stem. And you can actually just remove that little plantlet and plant it right into the soil, just like a brand new little transplant. Keep it, you know, good and moist at first. Give it a chance to get those roots nice and strong. And it's so easy to have, like, plant up a million new little baby spider plants. So here's a picture of what a little spider plantlet would look like. Like I said, some orchids have similar um, plantlets that they grow, and you can try that. Orchids are, I probably won't touch on orchids because um, they're kind of hard, and I kill them all the time. So, but spider plants, easy. They have the plantlets too. This is how you would want to propagate them. Um, and that's kind of the propagation section. I think I saw a couple chats come up if uh, we can answer those, um, those propagation questions. Yeah, there was a question about a cat who loves to munch plants. Uh, so she was wondering what she should avoid. So I did put the ASPCA website because I know that one's a good resource for pet and plants, but yeah. I didn't know if you had any off the top of your head, Cherie. That's perfect. The ASPCA has a good trusted list of plants that actually are, um, could be toxic. I know it's like, it, it's easy to just put my, I don't have cats, I have dogs. It's easy to just put them high enough so the dogs can get them, but cats are kind of another story. Um, so yeah, it's hard to keep them away. And if they do like to munch plants, I would definitely just check out the ASPCA list to make sure that you don't, a lot of house plants have toxic compounds. So just definitely want to stick with those non-toxic ones um, unless you can actually exclude the cat from getting into the area, which I know is so hard with a cat. But yeah, I think that article is the perfect suggestion. Awesome. It doesn't look like we have any questions about propagation. If anyone does, please feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I feel like personally the spider plants are a great first start for propagation because those little babies are easy. 
So um, easy. <laughs> yes. That's how my plant collection started, was from a spider plant clipping, so. Yep, awesome. Yeah, cool. Yeah, spider plants are definitely the one to start with propagation. <laughs> cool, so I'll move on. And now I'm just going to kind of talk about some specific plants. I've just picked a few that I feel like are kind of common, um, a couple that are kind of cool, and um, I'll touch on them. There's so many plants. If you have a specific question about a specific plant, I might have to look it up <laughs> if it's one I've never heard of, but happy to get back to you. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. So um, let's get into it. This is, I'll start with a disclaimer. A lot of these pictures, or some of them anyway, are from plants that are actually mine. And I just moved, so some of them are not looking super happy, but I wanted to still use some of my own pictures. So that's why. Um, so anyway, this is pothos, a really common plant, super duper easy. I inherited this pothos from my husband's grandfather when he passed away. It's probably been in this pot for decades and it's still doing great. I, I just cut it before we moved and like I said it wasn't super happy about the move but it's starting to pick back up. Um, it's just so easy. I mean it doesn't need a lot of attention. You do want to allow your media to dry slightly like we talked about between watering. Low to medium light is perfectly fine. So if you have like some corner that doesn't get a lot of light, a pothos is perfect. Um, one of the nicknames for pothos is actually devil's ivy because it can actually survive in the dark. It doesn't need a lot of light at all. There are a lot of cultivars that have different variegation patterns on the leaves. So, you know, look for one that's kind of different and cool if that's what you're into. If your leaves start to get really pale, that might mean they're getting too much light. If they don't have enough variegation um, from what you're used to, that might be too little light. So those are just a couple of things to look for. Um, pothos looks great on a shelf or in a hanging container because it, it you know, tends to crawl and cascade and you can kind of get the best um, benefit out of that growth habit on a shelf or in a hanging container. Um, philodendron, here's another one of mine. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of different varieties of philodendron. Generally speaking, care is gonna be pretty much the same. Um, this is like I think I just said the blushing philodendron, um, but generally speaking, they have kind of heart-shaped leaves. They're another very easy plant, tolerant of neglect. Just ask mine. Um, indirect light is good. Direct sun rays on the leaves can tend to burn them, so you you want it to be indirect. Um, Temperature should be above fifty. So this is one where when somebody was asking about temperature before, I mean fifty is pretty cold, I feel like, to have your house, but maybe some people like it that way, but this would be one that wouldn't respond well to that. Um, again, let the media dry slightly between waterings. That's going to be something I probably repeat on most of these here. Climbing varieties, such as the blushing philodendron that you see here, will need like a post or some kind of support so that they can do their climbing. Uh, peace lily, like I said, a, a ton of these. This is one that I uh, was looking particularly jazzed up on this day. I was taking pictures, so there's one of my peace lilies. Um, it's cool because a lot of houseplants are just foliage. They're just leaves, but the peace lily will actually flower. This one's not flowering right now, but they have a pretty white spathe-shaped flower, and they are so easy. I picked a lot of them that are so easy because those are really the only ones I like to grow. Um, they'll bloom in low light. They'll do just fine in low light. The leaves rise straight from the soil. So this is one that you can um, propagate with division. It will need regular moisture and the peace lily is one that will tell you that. It will start to droop so much on like the first day that it needs water and then you'll water it and an hour later it looks totally happy. So that's one thing I like about it is I don't really have to put a lot of thought into it. I just walk into a room and say, uh-oh, somebody's thirsty today. And I am able to give my peace lily some water. Um, we kind of talked about this, but you will want to dust the leaves of your um, peace lilies or spray them off. Um, no leaf shine. They actually tend to attract more dust. And then if it doesn't flower, try to increase the light just a little bit. It will bloom in low light, but it does need, you know, a certain level before it will bloom. So you can increase a little bit if it isn't blooming. And again, many, many cultivars with different variegation patterns that you can look for. Um, there's some really, really big ones, some really uh, small ones. So lots and lots available. Uh, weeping fig tree. 
This is a little bit of a harder one. They really don't like to be messed with. They don't like to be moved or repotted. So try not to do those things unless absolutely necessary. When you do, you know, if you do move it or when you first bring it into your home, it is probably going to drop leaves. Um, any kind of stress at all, it'll drop leaves. But don't worry. Um, try to find a good spot for it and leave it there. Let it acclimate. The leaves will regrow and it will recover, but um, it will definitely start to start to let you know if it has any kind of stress at all. Medium to high light is good. You can see this one is not mine. It's beautiful and mine would not probably look that good, but it's like right in those two bright windows and doing real good. Um, only water it when the top couple inches of soil are dry. And it's a relatively heavy feeder. This is definitely one that needs to be fertilized. Um, others you could probably get away with never fertilizing, but not the fig tree or any other of the ficus. You definitely will want to, to fertilize them at least a couple times a year probably. And then we have the fiddle leaf fig. Um, again, it has these big green leaves, so you need to keep them clean and dust them. It, they will get pretty tall if they're happy. Um, just like with the weeping fig tree, don't repot it or move it unless you absolutely need to. They don't really like to be messed with at all. Highlight is great. Um, again, just water when those top couple inches of soil dry out. And just like with the tree, it might drop leaves while acclimating to a new environment. It's not something to worry about. Just keep up the good care. Uh, try to leave it alone a little bit and it should recover. Cast iron plant. Um, super tough plant. If you are just getting started and or you really just are like a houseplant killer, try a cast iron plant to boost your confidence because they're so easy. Um, they kind of like a piece of leaf. They don't really have stems. The leaves just come out of the soil. They will take uh, part to full shade. This one will like a little bit of a lower light environment. Bright light will burn it. It prefers to be dry, so just ignore it, and it will be totally happy. That's my kind of plant. I don't know about you. Spider plant. This is my spider plant in my window. Um, you can see those brown tips and um, probably need to do better about letting my water sit out, but another very easy one. Another one I inherited that has been in this pot for who knows how long and still does great. Uh, doesn't really make babies, but it's a very old plant, um, so that happens. They'll take partial shade. This window that I have mine in is a north-facing window, so it doesn't get a whole lot of light really, um, but it does great. They're usually always variegated in some ways, so they have really nice looking leaves. You can let it dry out between waterings. You only want to repot a spider plant when you could actually literally see the roots showing on top of the soil. Um, it, when that happens, you probably want to move it up, but if, it, if you don't really see roots on top, just leave it. Like I said, this one, I don't even know. It's probably been in that pot for 20 years, maybe. Um, and the leaf tips, like we talked about, will brown when watered with tap water. So let it sit out. Aloe vera, like I mentioned earlier, the world's most popular searched house plant. Everybody loves an aloe vera. Um, it's a succulent. It will want high light levels. Direct is fine, indirect is fine, so long as it's bright and it's getting a lot of light. <laughs> It's very drought tolerant. Definitely, definitely, definitely don't want to overwater this one. Let it dry out even more than you would let the other ones dry out in between waterings. If you want to use the gel in the leaves, you'll want to remove the oldest leaves closest to the base and then just cut them off and squeeze the gel out. You don't want to ingest the gel. Um, just use it, you know, topically on your skin. And they don't need a lot of fertilizer, if any. So don't this, you know, definitely don't want to fertilize this one every time you're fertilizing your ficus. It will not appreciate it. Snake plant, another very, very tough plant and really cool looking, I think. It has these long, stiff, leathery leaves. It's very adaptable when it comes to light. <clears throat> so it can take low light, it can take high light. Um, it's just pretty flexible when it comes to that. It really would prefer a dry soil, so if you're going to mess up in one direction, underwater it rather than overwater it. And it's really not picky about humidity. So this is a really great Colorado plant. It can really take that dry air just fine. Palms, there's a tons and tons of varieties of palms. 
most all of them can adapt to or actually prefer more shade and more of a low light situation. So this is a perfect one for somewhere that doesn't get a ton of light. Again, let it dry out between waterings. Sound like a broken record on that one, but that's really what most of them want. Don't over prune a palm. Um, sometimes a frond will turn yellow, but the palm still draws nutrients from those yellowing or even browning fronds. So don't go and prune it right away. Wait a little bit, let it suck the rest of the nutrients out, and then, you know, eventually when it's totally dried up, you can prune it off. Um, if you start seeing your older leaves dying off a lot, they might have a potassium deficiency. So there's palm fertilizer and potassium fertilizer that you can get. It doesn't really oftentimes require a lot of fertilizer, but an occasional feeding is beneficial. Jade, <coughs> excuse me. If there was like a second place most popular plant, I would guess jade might be it because everybody loves jade. <coughs> the leaves will actually become red tipped if they're in high light, so that looks kind of cool. Um, it's a succulent, obviously, a very long-lived plant. They can live a very, very long time if they're happy. High light, warm temperatures work well. Again, let those first couple inches dry out between waterings. And, um, you know, I've never had a jade that flowers, but one of my friends has a jade that will flower every once in a while, and it is a treat. They're beautiful. Um, usually they flower on short days when the temperatures start to drop. So uh, it's, it's awesome if your jade is so happy that it's flowering for you. Lipstick plant, such a beautiful plant. Again, not a lot of these flower, and this one has these really reliable red flowers that kind of resemble lipstick tubes. That's why it's called lipstick plant. But it's a vining plant. Again, put it on a shelf or in a hanging basket for the, the best effect. Um, it's a pretty reliable flower. Flower is pretty good usually. High humidity is preferred. Um, this one you want to keep pretty well watered, uh, maybe a little bit more than some of the other plants we've talked about. Cold water temperatures can cause the leaves to brown, so let your water kind of warm up and sit out before you water. And it want, you want it to have really good bright light for at least a part of the day. Hoyas, uh, lots of different varieties again, but generally speaking, the Hoyas in general are long-lived. Um, you, you know, can inherit it or pass it down to your children probably. Um, easy to grow. You want to let the soil dry out a little bit between watering. Maybe I'll just stop saying that. Just do that for all the plants. <laughs> um, bright and indirect light. You don't want direct rays, but you do want it to be bright. Um, and they will shoot out, you can kind of see on the right in this picture, these little stems without leaves. Those are called spurs, and that's what the plant will flower from. They form flowers on their old spurs, so you don't want to prune those off. You want to leave them so that your plant will flower. And umbrella plants, um, warmer temperatures above 60 degrees doesn't really like it to fall below 60. It does need a little bit more water than some of the other ones that we've talked about. Bright indirect light, it can tolerate direct though, so just anything bright uh, prefers indirect, but if, if some of the rays are getting on it, that's just fine. It's a little bit flexible about um, watering. Um, you don't, so it does need a little bit more water, but it does not definitely want to be soggy. And you definitely don't want to leave it sitting in a saucer of water. So you just kind of have to find the perfect balance. Um, wipe the leaves down, and if you want it to grow a little bit bushier, rather if it's starting to get a little bit leggy, just pinch the growing tips to encourage it to grow out rather than up so much. So that is what I have. Um, I can take any last minute questions. If I have my email address here. If you want to shoot me any emails about um, houseplant questions or other plant questions, I'm happy to answer them. Awesome. Um, someone is asking a very specific question about their jasminum polyanthem plant and having some issues with that. So I might recommend that person email you directly since that's a pretty specific ask and story about their plant um, dying and wanting to know what they could do to solve that. So I'm gonna encourage yeah. the anonymous attendee who asked that question. I'm sure Sheree would be able to help you with that, but maybe send a direct email since you have a specific scenario. Yes, um, let's talk for sure. 
Awesome. Um, any other questions? Looks like someone has a question about ferns. Not sure exactly what the question is. It just says ferns. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ferns are great. Um, they will want to be a little bit uh, more moist than some of the others. Um, there's lots of uh, different varieties that you can get, and I could see my neighbor's ferns hanging in our window. They look fantastic. Um, you know, me medium to bright light, they, they definitely won't want low light, um, not direct rays. Um, you, they don't want to get too hot is the reason there. Um, you know, don't let it dry out between waterings, just like I said with most of them. Um, like most, they like a little bit of higher um, humidity. Um, low humidity can cause the fronds to kind of brown. Um, they do great in terrariums for that reason, or even like in your um, bathroom. Um, temperatures, I would say they, you know, they would like it um, maybe on a little bit on the lower side of that range that I gave you, just not too hot, or they could start to lose some of their fronds. Awesome. It looks like Wendy was wondering, she said sometimes she'll leave a plant in the same soil for 10 to 20 years and they seem to do fine. She'll sometimes add a cup or two of soil, but when she repots them, they seem to be not very happy. Any thoughts yeah, on that? Totally. I mean, some, some plants, they just don't want to be repotted and, and absolutely if they're doing well in their pots and you know for 10 20 years that's great that means that they love that pot and they don't want to leave it so <laughs> um yeah you can totally add a, add some soil because you might kind of lose some um over the years or you know some might spill out I know my kids always knocking down my plants and some soil spills out but um yeah don't repot them if they're doing good no, no need to repot them at all. They're, they're perfectly happy where they are. And if somebody just typed in, how can they stay in that same old soil? Um, you know, some houseplants are just super low maintenance. And um, I'm sure that, you know, if they are, is, if it is a plant that's been in its pot for that long, it's going to need to be fertilized. And that'll kind of jazz that soil up and add some nutrients to it. Um, you know, adding some um, slow release fertilizer is good for those kind of situations. But you know, sometimes disturbing the roots and disturbing the plant is worse than just letting it sit in that same old pot. And some plants actually like to be root bound as a lot of house plants. So yeah, I think before repotting, good good idea to Google it before you do, right? Because sometimes it can yeah. do more harm than good to repot it. Totally. <laughs> uh, we have a question in the QA wondering about the care of a Christmas cactus and how to know if they need to be repotted. I know that's a little bit more specific, so we can definitely have them email. Yeah, um, I mean, Christmas cactus ha does have some specific care, particularly about like getting it to bloom. There's some really specific stuff that you would want to do. And we have a great fact sheet. If you just Google CSU extension Christmas cactus, we have a whole fact sheet on it and it's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would probably err on the side of not repotting it. If it is like busting out of its pot, then you can go ahead and repot it. But otherwise, I would try to leave it um, in its pot. Awesome. Any other last questions that anyone has? We've got just a couple more minutes if you have them. Awesome. Well, hopefully you grab Cherie's email uh, so that you can send her any specific questions and yeah, that resource of CSU Extension's website. I definitely go on there a lot with some of my houseplant questions. It's very, very helpful. Um, I will be sending out this recording of this presentation as well as Cherie's slides and if um, if there's anything else you need, please feel free to contact me. I sent everyone an email this morning. Uh, but thank you so much, Sheree. It's always a pleasure working with you. And this was super informative and awesome. No Any problem. Time? Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you everyone so much. I hope that you all are inspired to maybe do something new with your houseplants or go get a new one today. It's a great way to treat yourself. Um, I actually did see someone in the Q&A earlier ask about where to buy plants locally. I always recommend looking at your plant nurseries, Googling your local plant nursery. Sometimes even grocery stores can have them as well, but I like looking at plant nurseries personally. Yep, me too. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everyone so much. Take care, stay stalwart, and go Rams! <laughs>